They tell me in Yugoslavia that uh, when they start making a particular tube, see, they don't make any tube continuously. They'll make tubes in batches. And they like to make enough to last them for the year. So in a typical factory that produces a lot of tubes, they might make a half a million 12AX7s over a period of a couple of months. And then they put away the 12AX7 tooling and make something else. Uh, it is also interesting to note that with almost all of the 12 series, the 12AU7 and the 12AX7 share identical cathodes and identical plates, and only the grid is different. It's the grid that determines the gain of the tube. And by the way, if you get into the fine points of tubes, it turns out that the gain of the tube is merely the ratio of the diameter of the grid wire to the spacing of the grid wire. So if you took apart a 12AX7, you might see the same diameter grid wire, but much wider spaced, because the 12AU7 has a gain of around 15 or so, and the 12AX7 has a gain of typically 100. Now let's uh, take one more look at what's left here. We have the cathode, and we're going to pull that out. Now the cathode is a very pure sleeve of nickel and it's generally bought as a long tube and they cut it or they can fold it out of a sheet but in any event they make a cylinder and then they coat the outside of the cylinder with this white powder which is the actually emissive coating and it's made again of certain oxides that are mixed up in water basically and sprayed on there inside this cathode sleeve we have the heater and I'm going to pull the heater out now and there's the heater it is a very thin tungsten wire, and this happens to be a spiral heater as opposed to a folded heater. Spiral heaters give you less hum with AC circuits, so spiral heaters are the more popular thing. Um, this spiral goes up and it comes back down again, and as you can see on the two ends, these are the two ends where they welded the tube. Now, this is very interesting that uh, a lot of people have noticed that 12AX7s, at the bottom of the tube, when you turn it on, you often get a bright flash right below that bottom mica. And it concerns some people, because they also look at if they have a, several 12AX7s in an amplifier, they all flash a little differently. Well, the flash is not a problem, and the, let me assure you, the flash you can ignore. But the reason for the flash is interesting, in that at the bottom of this coated spiral, they actually have to scrape off a little of the coating so they can spot weld the bottom of that heater to the base here. And it's that little bit of uncoated heater that flashes. And you might think, well, gee, that's going to fail sometime soon. But quite frankly, these tubes are rated for 10,000 cycles of turn-on and also 10,000 hours. If you do the math, that means you can turn your equipment on once per hour and you'll tube will fail either from just wearing out or heater failure at around the same time. So basically all this talk about leaving stuff on all the time is not such a good idea because the tube only has 10,000 hours of life and whether it's playing music or not, if it's on, the hours are going by. So I think now we'll just say one more thing and this is the, this is the important part of the whole deal is that when you heat this cathode, this is the part that ends up glowing red. And sometimes you can see the heater inside the cathode glowing a little orange or a little hotter than the cathode. And sometimes part of the heater even sticks up above the cathode, in power tubes especially. Uh, and you see that glowing a little differently than the cathode itself because it's hotter. It has to give its heat to the cathode so it's running at a higher temperature. These Cat, these heaters will not sit above the cathode because they want to put that spring on the top to hold the cathode steady. So they wouldn't want the heater sticking up with that going on. Now from the cathode here, the electrons are emitted and they have to flow through this grid wire to get to the plate. The plate is at a high DC potential and it's positive so the electrons of course are attracted to the plate but the grid has the ability, if it's negative, to repel the electrons. That's how we get amplification. It turns out that this grid is quite effective in, in controlling the electrons, and one volt of difference on the grid can cause 100 volts of difference on the plate. That's where you get the gain. That's the gain of 100. If you had a 12AU7 here with a gain of around 15, one volt on the grid would only produce 15 volts on the plate, and you wouldn't get as much gain.
And you might ask, well, why do they make things like 12 AU7s? Well, they make them because they're more suited for higher current applications, and they have other factors such as plate resistance that we could get into at some later point. The interesting thing to note about the 12AX7, it's my belief that this tube was designed by RCA, um, and possibly the same reason in Europe to make console radios and serial equipment. And they wanted a tube that had about the highest gain you could achieve, and in triodes, a gain of 100 of a 12AX7, this is the highest gain triode that exists. And it's frankly rather easy to make, and they needed to make a bunch of these because it takes quite a few of these to make a, a complete amplifier, especially if you're starting with a very small signal like a microphone or a phonograph cartridge. Now let's put all this stuff away, and, and someday you may take a tube apart and have some fun looking at that. Now, what we want to talk about now is going back to our schematic, getting all these two bits away, of the, and is this centered well? To my cameraman. Okay. Uh, we want to, now we can look at these pieces as they exist on the schematic. So here is the cathode, and we'll, we'll pick him up and put him over here. There's our cathode, and here's our grid that the electrons have to flow through, and here's our plate that's going to receive the electrons. So we you saw how these were originally in the two. See, this is steel. You can see it's sticking to my slightly magnetized pliers, as is the grid side rods are evidently steel and the cathode's got something in there too that's interesting it's supposed to be nickel well now the way this ampli this makes an amplifier a, a tube by itself like a transistor cannot be an amplifier by itself it needs a power supply and in case of a tube it needs two power supplies one to heat the cathode and then one to supply the electricity that we're going to use to make it amplify. Now you can think of a tube as a valve, and in Europe they call tubes valves because the, you can consider this grid as like the controlling element of a valve. You can open it up or close it, and you can, with a fair amount of ease, control a great amount of, say, flow of water at even high pressures through a valve. And by the way, the, in electrical analogies, there's uh, for people who have a little trouble with electricity because you can't see it, the water analogy is one of my favorites. In the water analogy, the pressure of the water, say, in your faucet is analogous to the voltage. Higher voltage is analogous to higher pressure. Current is like the flow of water, and if we use a garden hose or something, we certainly know the difference between the amount of flow and the pressure. There's certainly a difference if you, if you um, take the pressure off, then you'll get more flow. So the current then is like the flow. It's the amount of water, or in this case, the amount of current, the number of electrons that's flowing from the cathode to the plate. Now, as we said before, the electrons are doing the work, but we like to think about things going from positive to negative, so we, we know that whenever an electron goes one way, there's a, another charge that goes the other way to make everything equal out. Now keep in mind that any circuit has to be complete, and the part we're not showing here is the power supply, which the plus would be connected up here to the plate load resistor, and the negative would be connected here to ground and supplying this 200 to 400 volts. And typically in a 12AX7, the typical current is a, a milliamp or less. Uh, I mentioned before, the purpose of something like a 12AU7 is because that, that tube can support about a 10 or 20 milliamp current. A 12AX7, after about 2 milliamps, it's done. You can't get, no matter what you do, you're not going to get more than 2 milliamps through a 12AX7. Unless you run the grid positive, and uh, that's generally not done. So, back to our little circuit here. How does this thing amplify? Well, if we just use some easy numbers, if we were to put a volt on the grid, mm -hmm. this grid being a very fine grid and high gain tube, you will get a change of 100 volts on the plate. Now, we only have 100 volts of DC, so if we really wanted to put a volt here and get 100 volts out here, we would use a higher B+. That's one of the reasons for using a higher B+. But also keep in mind that even though the mu of this tube is 100, and that's what's in the book, when you actually measure it, as we do in a typical circuit, 
the gain is about 50. So with a tube like a 12AX7, you can't get much above 50. You might get up to 60 or so. And that's because part of this energy that's being amplified is being lost in the plate load resistor. Now, they're telling you the truth that the tube really has a gain of 100, and to get the gain of 100, you have to remove all loads. So in essence, this plate resistor needs to become infinite, which is then a problem because you can't put any current through an infinite resistor. And this load would have to become infinite. And you can actually get close. If you made this load about 10 mega ohms, which you could, it's getting a little high, and you made this resistor several mega ohms, and you made this voltage 2,000 volts instead of 200, you could get close to that gain of 100. You could also put what's called a current source here, but it would have to have a very high impedance. The actual gain of the tube can be determined by a simple formula comparing the load resistance, the total of all the load resistances, to the internal resistance of the tube, which is called the plate resistance, or RP in the tube manual. RP of this tube is very high. I think it's around 80,000 ohms. So it gets very easily loaded. By the way, because the RP is very high, that means you can't put much of a load out here because you're just going to keep lowering the gain as you load it. But generally in the 12AX7 circuit, you're followed by another 12AX7 or by some other tube that has very little load. The 12AX7 is really never intended to do any, any work. It's just amplifying voltage. Remember that if you want power, such as power to drive a speaker, you need a power tube because you need to conduct some significant current in addition to the voltage. Here we have virtually no current. We have a milliamp. In a power tube, you might have a couple of hundred milliamps. Then you can get some output for a speaker. Now, the only other thing we need to talk about here, I believe, is this output coupling capacitor that I think it bothers some people. Um, this is a very important thing because here on the plate we have this 100 volts of DC or 200 volts of DC. We don't want to put that to the outside world. We certainly can't put that on the grid of the next tube because the grid of the next tube needs to be zero just as the grid of this tube was. There are schemes to direct couple tubes, but that gets more complicated. And again, it's rather rare. So here we have a capacitor. Now what happens when you turn this thing on is this capacitor charges up such that there, when the tube is finally fully conducting and everything's stable, which is, only takes about 30 seconds, this 100 volts exists on this side of the capacitor and zero exists on this side, so there's actually 100 volts across this capacitor, which you could measure with a voltmeter. And the signal, though, can go through the capacitor because the signal is a changing voltage. So as this plate terminal goes up and down as the current is changing, and the current's changing because we put a voltage on the grid. And the voltage on the grid is controlling the flow of electrons. And again, this grid can control the flow of electrons very easily. And again, the ratio is about 100 to 1 or 50 to 1 in actual use. So we have our 50 volts up here of AC. And it's literally wiggling this side of the capacitor up and down. And this side of the capacitor is going to follow that voltage. It's also going to follow any variations in the 100 volt B plus, but we've stabilized that pretty well through regulation or larger capacitors. By the way, that's why filter capacitors are always much larger than the coupling capacitor. It might be interesting to point out at this time that some people believe that the, the style of this capacitor, the material it's made from, is extremely important, and people have gone to very exotic oil-filled or Teflon capacitors. I don't believe this is a terribly important place to put that kind of capacitor because the AC voltage across it is unchanging. So why do we really care what material is in there as a dielectric if the AC voltage is not changing? Just my own personal opinion. I'd say for now that I hope explains how a single stage amplifier works and next we will deal with a two stage amplifier.